years young, Mr. Norman Hurricane Smith. I know your memories are still pretty good. Take us back, before we talk about the Beatles, how it was that you found yourself working at the EMI Studios when the, before the Beatles came along. Oh, well now that's a long story. Give us the headlines. <laughs> well the headlines were that uh, I really, first of all, uh, applied to the BBC. Uh, because I was a jazz musician with my own jazz quintet trying to earn a living. But in those days, it was very difficult to earn a living from jazz. Uh, but I thought, I, I thought, oh, wow, perhaps I can get into the production department of the BBC. So I uh, applied to the BBC for an interview and went along and uh, I told them what I would like to do. So they said, well, have you done any engineering? So I thought, engineering? I thought they grease monkey and all that, you know. <laughs> so I said, no, I haven't done any engineering. No, I don't see what that's got to do with production of music. So they said, oh, yes, well, you see, you can't, you can't get into the production department until you've been an engineer. So I thought, oh, well, that's strange, okay. So they said, you know, come back when you've done some engineering. <laughs> so I, anyway, I, it so happens that my, my brother-in-law then was the manager of an engineering refrigeration uh, <laughs> company. So, and he said, well, I can get you on, into the uh, engineering shop, you know, the floor, uh, to learn some engineering. So... I, I said, oh, I, I'll, I'll do that then. So I stuck that for a couple of years, I suppose, that I was fully fledged, as I thought, to be an engineer. And I went back to the BBC and said, well, here I am again. I've now got engineering experience. So they said, well, you know, what have you been doing? So I, I said, well, uh, refrigeration. <laughs> so they said, no, we didn't mean that kind of engineer. <laughs> we meant music so uh, that was that you know so then I I, I stuck with the uh, refrigeration engineering and went to night school uh, to learn about the uh, electronics etc and then whilst doing that I saw this advertisement come up uh, I think it was in the Times newspaper saying recording assistant required at Abbey Road Studios. So I thought, well, um, I might as well apply for it. Oh, there was a ceiling age of 28. By this time, I was 36. And so I applied for the job saying that I was 30. <laughs> I took six years off my age, but I said, I'm 30. I know I'm a couple of years over the ceiling, but um, I hope this won't disqualify me at least for an interview. So, I got the interview. I went along to Abbey Road, and uh, these two gentlemen, the management of uh, Abbey Road, interviewed me, and uh, they said, you know, what have you done, etc., and where was I educated, and I told them that, and uh, that I was a jazz musician, etc. So, one of the questions that the manager asked me is, what do you think of Cliff Richard? So being a jazz musician, I said, 
quite nauseating actually. <laughs> so he, and afterwards I thought, you idiot. What have you said? You know, your big mouth. So anyway, but the, the manager said, well, uh, well, I'll tell you something, Smith. He does me as well. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, that relieved me to some extent. So I said, well, he, he, so he said, but you will have to work, you know, with that kind of music if, uh, if, you, if you're taken on, if you get the job. So I did say to him, well, to be fair, sir, um, you asked me my own opinion as a jazz musician. That doesn't mean to say I couldn't work with him, because I, I can assure you that I can. And I think I can be of, of use with my musical knowledge, because I was trained as an arranger as well, uh, you know. And uh, anyhow, he said, all right, we'll, we'll let you know. And then I got the letter, of course, uh, offering me the job. Now, that was, I think, in 59, was that? 1959. 1959. Yeah. Now, we only have uh, 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 about an hour of time today, and then you'll be here back tomorrow. And you've got so many stories, so we're going to have to jump through it a little bit. Of course, the full story is in your new book, yeah. John Lennon Called Me Normal. Yeah. And we'll talk about the book in a few moments. But I'm going to jump through a couple more years. So, between 1959 and 1962, you've been learning the ropes comparatively old in Abbey Road's terms, of 36. So by the time the Beatles come along, you're 38, 39, which is, con for the Beatles, that's considered quite old. They were in their early 20s. Yes. You come, they come along early in 1962. What, just in headlines, do you remember of that amazing first recording test? Because it was a test that's that right. they came for first. Yeah. What do you remember about that? Well, the first thing that I was surprised at, because there were four main uh, in-house producers at EMI, each of which had an assistant. And it was always the assistant producer that came to these artist tests or auditions. But I was sat uh, at the controls, uh, waiting for the console, waiting for the session to start. And the control room door opened, and who walked in but George Martin himself. So that was surprise number one, because I thought, well, this must be some kind of special audition for George to, to come. It should have been his assistant, Ron Richards. Uh, and then shortly after that, this, the studio door opened, and in walked these four guys, the like of which I hadn't seen before with their hairstyles, etc., you know. And I thought, well, this is surprise number two. It's, uh, it it's probably is going to be some kind of special audition. So anyway, I, I went down to introduce myself to the boys, and uh, they in turn said, yeah, I'm Paul, I'm John, I'm George, and Pete. It was Pete Best then. So I said, okay, well, it's nice to meet you guys. And then uh, I detected the Liverpool accent, and I was always uh, in awe of the Liverpool accent because there have been so many great comedians that have come out of Liverpool. So I said, okay, boys, well, this is what I want you to set up. So I showed them in the studio. We had to set up and uh, put the mics out. But the, the thing was that uh, the amplifiers of George Harrison and John Lennon were those tiny little Vox amps, you know, about 18 inches square. So I put the amps up on a couple of chairs and put the mics up, etc. Paul's was a bit bigger, his, uh, his uh, bass amplifier. And I said, OK, well, I'm going upstairs now to uh, have a listen to you. And went upstairs, opened up the microphones, and I couldn't believe the noises that were coming out of their amplifiers. <laughs> it was extraneous noises, squeaks, and, oh, terrible. I thought, well, we can't do anything about this. So I, I went down again to see if there was anything I could do if the jack plugs, etc., were in properly, <laughs> etc. And, but there's nothing I could do then, so I called for a technical engineer to come down. Um, I said to him, you better bring a soldering iron because uh, it looks as though it's pretty serious, you know. So, and he came down and he couldn't do anything with the amplifiers either. So what he and I did, we raided an echo chamber. And that, that, an echo chamber is a special, specially designed room where you can add 
echo to any sound source. And it had equipment in that room. So we robbed that to get the, the kind of, at least get us some sort of sound that we could listen to what the Beatles had to offer. So we started. And uh, I think the first title, which surprised me very much, was a thing, an old song called Besame Mucho. Uh, then there, I think we did P.S. I Love You. That was one of theirs. I can't remember whether we actually did Love Me Do or not. But anyhow, we got through that somewhat belatedly because of all the higher hang-ups and trying to get some sort of sound. And um, uh, at the end of that, uh, George Martin said, OK, boys, well, you better come up into the control room. And uh, he, George, started telling them what he would be looking for in terms of what might be attractive to uh, him to sign them to EMI. And he was talking to them for about 10 minutes or so. And then he handed them over to me. And the uh, first thing I said, you know, uh, going through the, the sounds that they were offering me. So I said, you've got to do something about that sound so that I can at least try to make some improvement to that sound. Uh, if you give me something basic to start with. But today has been uh, very difficult, that kind of thing. So we went on for uh, 20 minutes or so, lecturing them. There was not a sign of an expression on any of their faces. They were all were standing to attention, listening to us. And um, then in George Martin said to them, OK, lads, well, you know, we've been lecturing you uh, for some time. Is there anything you want to say to us? Silence. And they sort of looking George up and down, looking me up and down, etc. Then all of a sudden it was George Harrison. He said, yeah, he said, looking at George Martin, I don't like your tie. <laughs> and with that, I mean, I just I almost fell off my chair. Uh, and it was the, the Liverpool humour they came out then for a while. And I, I thought, well, they, you know, they, there's something special with this group. George Martin was not enamored with what he had heard. Well, I mean, to be fair, we were not impressed. There was nothing to be impressed about at that time. Except for me, it was the, their humor. And there was something different. I, I had tested, auditioned several young guitar groups before them and there was nothing you know but uh, with this lot I could see that there was something anyhow they finally left uh, the, the control room and George Martin then said to me well what do you think about that lot so I said well I have to say that I know we haven't heard much today but to me there's something about this group that I think they should be signed. So George then he said, hmm, okay, I'll think about it. And that was the end of that audition. Well, thank you, that's a great insight into that first day. And I have to tell you, in Norman's book, he goes into even more detail about that and so many of the recording sessions. I'm gonna jump you ahead a little bit when you first started recording them seriously and they started settling down they were they were completely new to the recording studios and to techniques and this wasn't your favorite kind of music it wasn't your cup of tea and it wasn't george martin's experience either what was it that made you put the microphones where you did and the record them the way you did because the sound was so integral to the success of those records what was it that gave you the idea or the inspiration to record them the way you did? Yeah, okay, well, because I had uh, been on the road with my own jazz quintet, I knew how important it was for each musician to, uh, of a group like that to sit as close as they possibly could to one another. Now, EMI policy at that time was that we, uh, we had to 
separate, what, what we call separate the microphone so that if you open up one microphone on a particular instrument, that's all you want to hear. Uh, that. And so separation between the various microphones was essential. That was the EMI policy. But because of my experience of playing uh, with a jazz group, I thought, no, this won't do. These boys will be happier if I sit them close, closer together. So I, 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 did, that. I did just that. And um, I said to them, well, other engineers at, uh, at Abbey Road will turn down the volumes that you will be playing at according to what the, that engineer wants to hear that you're in. You'll get a mixture of, of both. So I thought, well, I think I can get that, I hope I can, by placing the microphones in a certain position, which I did. It, take, it took a little time that the boys were happy. That was my main concern. I wanted to keep them happy because I took to them with their personalities straight away. And uh, that's how I, by choice, or choice is, plural, of different microphones, I finally got the sound that pleased my ears. And I must say, give George Martin credit. He never interfered with the sound that I was getting. He either approved or didn't approve. If he didn't approve, I would ask him why. But fortunately, he did approve <laughs> to, to, to my sound. And that's how I got it, really, by experimentation or distance of the microphones, choice of microphones from the various guitars, etc. Now, there must have been a time in those years, right through to the end of 65, there must have been a point, a turning point, where your ears pricked up and thought, hello, they're a bit more special than we even thought at the beginning. There must have been a, a song or a session where they started to go beyond their original promise. What was that moment for you when you thought, hello, they're going a little bit further? Well, I mean, the, the very first session was the Love Me Do session. And George Martin didn't turn up for that session. He sent his assistant which was very strange because I had heard or been rumoured that the Beatles were already signed to MI before, before the, the, the original audition, the original artist test. That did make some sense to me in actual fact because I, afterwards I thought or later perhaps this is why George Martin himself came to the audition. So the rumour did uh, lean, uh, showed me some kind of truth that, uh, of, that, of that rumour that was going around. But, however, Ron and I, get, to get back to the first session of Love Me Do, Ron Richards and I were in charge of, uh, of doing something with that title. And um, it wasn't very successful, I'm afraid, because Ron, Ron, Ron Richards, didn't take to Pete Best's drumming. And, uh, he, you know, he said, uh, no, the, the drummer's not good enough for, for, this, for, for this particular title. So I, I said, well, uh, it's not what he's playing, or uh, uh, rather, it's not how he's playing it, Ron, it's what he's playing. And I think the head arrangement, as they were called then, uh, the head arrangement is all wrong. And I don't think he's playing the, the right sort of thing for this number. So, but uh, he, he was uh, stuck in his mind that he, he, Pete Best wasn't good enough. So we abandoned that very first session. We didn't get a, a master take. And then he and uh, George Martin, his boss, Ron Richards, I'm talking about, uh, got together to talk about this problem, as Ron saw it, about Pete Best. However, we, we made a, a, another session uh, with the same boys, Pete Best on drums, we love me do. This time, George Martin attended, as well as Ron Richards. So there was now three of us. And uh, George eventually, cutting a long story short, George eventually agreed with Ron that Pete Best was not good enough. So that was another session that was cancelled. And then uh, the next uh, thing happened that uh, they had the Beatles with Brian Epstein 
I got rid of Pete Best and uh, brought in Ringo, Ringo Starr. And um, to me, I said, well, I don't know. I did find out later that the, 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 I thought it was Brian Epstein that uh, uh, had made this change of drummer. But I did find out later for that the boys themselves were impressed with Ringo Starr and they weren't too happy with Pete Best because he was getting all the attention from the girls. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, they, they, they really meant that too. And so a combination of Ron Richards not liking Pete Best drumming, the boys not liking Pete getting all the attention from the girls, and uh, to me, he was playing the wrong thing. In any case, on the, on the, on the Love Me Do head arrangement, led to Ringo joining to do and yet another session of Love Me Do with George Martin in charge. And blow me down if Ringo didn't pass the test as well <laughs> on the next session. And so what happened? George Martin brought in a session drummer called Andy White to play on the... Uh, Love Me Do session and uh, of course I mean Andy very experienced professional drummer was playing exactly what I had in mind he didn't need any dots or music and he fitted in like a hand in glove you know and that's how we got the master taken and that's the story of how we got the very first master of uh, Love Me Do and it, it of course was released and uh, I think it got to about number 17 was it? 17. 17, yeah. But the next uh, time we went in was uh, somewhat a little later. The boys have now got new equipment and it was please, please, please me. Different kettle of fish altogether. And it was from then on that, um, well, you know, each song that after that that they played was just unbelievable. And, uh, well, I suppose I might as well say now that um, I've been asked so many times in my life what was your favorite title of the Beatles songs and my only answer to that was all of them every single one and that's the only way I could answer it because uh, I mean the the magic of them grew and grew and grew now up until the Beatles in popular music there'd been a tradition that artists worked harder and tended to get better at doing the same thing. They tended to just improve in their already existing talented area. Mm. But when we listen now to the evolution and the growing sophistication of the Beatles, you listen to the way they're writing and singing and playing on Love Me Do, and then by Rubber Soul, the last record you did with them, you hear, I mean, it's a, an enormous change and there were more changes to come. All of that change, that had never happened before. Were you conscious of it at the time? So when you started the help sessions or started the rubber soul sessions, hello, the boys have written something a more sophisticated or this is a bit new. Were you conscious at the time or is it only looking back that you sense that? Ah, uh, not really. No, the only time where I was conscious of a, conscious of a change was... Uh, the last, from the last session, the last session, yes, that uh, we did, the last album, I should say, that we did before the beginning of the uh, Rubber Soul album. What had happened in between, I don't know, but um, before that, we had such a happy, almost family-like feeling, the six of us, them four, myself and George Martin. Incidentally, George Martin used to call himself the fifth Beatle when he was interviewed, uh, and I was the sixth. But then again, when I was interviewed, I was the fifth Beatle, <laughs> and he was the sixth. And you had seniority on George. Yeah. But uh, there was a big difference uh, from that feeling, uh, from, as I say, the, the album before Rubber Soul, to the beginning of Rubber Soul. And I, I felt it straight away from that very first session. I can't remember how long it was between those two set, uh, albums. It was only about six months. Well, that's long enough for them to 
been influenced by the Indian guru and grew their beards and I don't know perhaps they got into a bit of dope I don't know but uh, I think they may have been they may have been a, a faint exotic aroma in oh, the air yeah, that could be yeah it could be described like that <laughs> uh, but there was a big difference anyway noticeable very much to me uh, and I wasn't happy so much so that um, uh, the, the, the titles were taking longer to record. I could detect some kind of not very nice feeling between John and Paul, which I hated. You know, from the feelings that I had before all that, the, the family feeling, you know, to now, it upset me. It did upset me, it and I made it known. Was it just like, did it feel just like it was a sibling rivalry or was it, did you feel there was something else going on then? Because we, traditionally we don't think of there being rivalry of that kind until a couple of years later. No, well I think it, cert that certainly happened with John. He, he, he by now was uh, with Yoko and I think there was a, a, a big influence from her with John's thinking and this thinking of course Changed his, I believe, his style of song writing. Uh, whereas Paul was pretty constant with his uh, sort of song writing. But I think John got the feeling that Paul's songs, of course, they never really wrote together anyway. Um, he, John had the feeling that Paul's songs were now pretty twee. And I don't think he, you know, he went off his, his kind of songs. So there was this uh, difficulty, I suppose, uh, of uh, attaining the kind of smooth working that we'd had previously before with all the other albums. And it showed up so much so that I wanted to get out, you know. And the boys were pretty upset about that, you know, they wanted me to stay on. It, but then I had the offer because George Martin was leaving uh, EMI to start his own company, AR uh, Air, uh, and uh, an offer was forthcoming from uh, EMI for me to fill George Martin's uh, place in the production department to take over the Parlophone label, which of course I mean I've now got my uh, producer's uh, uh, ability. Uh, or job that I was after when I first applied to the BBC. I hoped, of course, it wouldn't have the same outcome as I had to the BBC. However, I, I got, got the job but, um, uh, at EMI as a, now a, a, a producer, uh, and I wanted to leave uh, the Robert Soul. We'd only done about two titles, but the boys were upset about that, and they asked me, would I stay on for the end of the, of the uh, album? Uh, and what they did, soon after we, we had this discussion, a parcel arrived for me from Aspreys of uh, London. And when I opened it, it was a beautiful gold carriage clock inspired, uh, in, in, uh, inscribed. inscribed by the Beatles to Norm, uh, Normal and uh, from us and uh, with well, that was a great softener for me and so I said yeah okay I will stay on to the end of Rubber Soul so that's what I did before even starting my job as a as a producer at, at EMI looking back do you have a regret because then you went on to an incredibly important things in your career and we'll touch on those in a moment but do you look back at all and say I wish I'd been. A, I wish I'd stayed on. Was there, was there a party that wishes you'd stayed on to do Revolver and Sergeant Pepper? Was there a little part of you that wishes you had? Well, of course. I mean, if it uh, if it hadn't been for the new job that uh, EMI were offering me, I would have done those those albums. Uh, but um, management at uh, EMI said to me, "Well, as you are now leaving to take up your new job." Uh, can you train the, the, the guy that we have in uh, mind to take over from you? Can you train him and make sure he will be capable of uh, taking over the Beatles? 
because now, of course, the Beatles were well established as a hit group and changed the whole scene of British recording. Uh, so I said, yeah, okay, well, I will do that. So I kept my eye, and it's, oh, they gave me his name, Geoffrey uh, uh, Emmerich. Uh, I said, yeah, okay. Well, Geoffrey had not started his employment with EMI that long. When, and I thought it was a very strange selection at the time, that he was the one that was going to take over from me to the Beatles. So uh, I did keep my eye on him, but uh, he, you know, he was managing okay, except for one thing. He didn't seem to have the right kind of personality to take over. So I took him to one side, and I said, now look, Jeffrey, you are going to be the sound engineer for the, the great Beatles, you are, will be in the front line of the greatest recording company in the world, EMI, and I want to see some kind of personality to fit that bill. But I'm not seeing it at the moment. So I stuck on for, uh, watching him for another couple of sessions or so, and he was improving. And at the end of those two sessions, he was showing me that he could at least handle the technical side of uh, uh, the balance engineer, the sound engineer. And his personality was beginning to show through, but um, you know, uh, at least I did see signs. So I, I, I said to management, yeah, he'll do. And of course, <laughs> he was lucky enough to, uh, well, certainly to, to uh, do uh, the big one, uh, Sergeant Pepper. And uh, because it, to me, it was a great album, you know, although Fortunately, a lot of my albums were also accorded the same aplomb. Well, rightly so. Now, in your book, which I've really got to commend, folks, you have to go out and buy this book. Um, and uh, Norman will be signing copies of the book at various times on the, uh, on the stands. All the schedule is printed in here and outside. In the book, you go on to mention the first big artist that you signed as head of Parlophone and produced a little band, I don't know if anyone here has heard of them, a band called Pink Floyd. The man who signed and produced Pink Floyd. Because this is not the fest for Floyd fans, we'll not go into that, but I wanted you to get the due kudos for that. Something you referred to, I mean, you, of course, uh, work and engineered many other artists during those days. I remember uh, some beautiful records you made with a, a, another artist that Brian Epstein managed. Um, you did some beautiful records with a chap. Do you remember Billy J. Kramer? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. But uh, uh, we, George Martin and I, we, we uh, put our heads together and we... Uh, selected um, the title, the first title, for Billy Jay to, to record. Uh, uh, actually, I forgot what it was. Do you what? want to know a secret? Do you want to know a secret, of course, yeah, that one. And of course he did a fine job, and he had the rights of personality, etc., to, to, uh, to be on the Parfum uh, label. So, uh, he did a fine job of it. And you did, you did several other records with him, I remember. You did uh, I mean, Little Children and Bad to Me. Oh, yeah. You, you did a lot of good records with them. Billy Jays, yeah. When did, I'm trying to think now. When did you last see Billy? When did you last see Billy J. Kramer? The last time? Wow, of course, that's a long, long time ago. It might have been. I took my children, and my wife, of course, <laughs> to a holiday on the Channel Islands. Jersey, and Billy J was uh, appearing there, etc. And uh, we, we went out eating uh, to restaurants together, etc. And uh, my daughter, who was probably about 12 years old, she fell in love with Billy J Kramer. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he, but he was very nice to both my daughter and my son Nick. Uh, very nice to them. And once again, you know. Uh, he was most certainly adopted into our own personal family. Well, actually, your answer isn't quite correct, or it won't be from about 10 minutes' time, because the last time you saw Billy J. Kramer is right now. Please welcome your old friend, Billy J. Kramer.
Nome. You know, I, I tell you, I, I just read in the newspaper a few weeks ago that you're going to be here, and I said to my wife, I got to go and see Norman Smith because to me, Norman Smith was a guy who never ever really got the credit for what he did for the Beatles. You know, and uh, I've always felt that. And, and you know, Norman, I was, I was a, a young kid when I uh, went to London and I was very intimidated by you. Uh, not by you, you were great. But George Martin used to really intimidate me, you know. Because he, he was like the Duke of Edinburgh or something, you know. <laughs> that kind of man. And, and whenever I was unhappy about something, Norman would tell me, go and tell him. And he kicked me up the ass many times to do that. And Norman, it's great to see you, man, after all this time. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> Where are you living now? I, I live in, in New York on Long Island. Oh, you do? Yes. I'm very happy. I'll, I'll st I'm not going to stay here all night. You know, I don't want to sort of rain on your parade. Have a great night, and I'll see you in a bit, Norman. Okay. We'll have a drink together. Oh, sure. Good sure. to see you, Billy. You too, man. The great Billy J. Kramer. Well. Wow. What a surprise. Well, we wanted to do a little surprise. We thought you'd get a kick That's out of that. very nice. Thank you. And for those of you uh, like myself and Norman who are fans of Billy Jay, Billy Jay has got an amazing new band together. Uh, he's got a concert coming up in uh, April the 28th here in New York at The Cutting Room. All the details just go to the website thecuttingroomnyc.com and go out and support our good friend Billy Jay Kramer. Thank you, Billy. So, um, no, don't, don't worry, I, I know your wife Eileen's here, I, I'm not going to surprise you and suddenly bring out all your old girlfriends, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Norman, um, we were talking, I remember last night, and we, we were talking about something that the Beatles had that was more than just the music. It was their humour and personality, and a lot of that humour was like the Goon Show, which was of course a British radio favourite in the 50s. Tell us a little bit of how you experienced that humour from them, especially from John. Oh, yeah. Ah, well, there were several things, of course, with John. Uh, one, one that comes back to mind was when John was going on his first skiing trip, skiing holiday. And um, before he left, I said to him, have you ever been skiing before, John? He said, no. So I said, well, now look, don't come back from your holiday. He was going for two weeks. Don't come back in two weeks' time with your leg in a plaster. <laughs> so I said, okay, okay. <laughs> so off he went. A couple of weeks later, or thereabouts, maybe three weeks later, I was doing uh, some work in number two studio and when you came out of the control room there was a long corridor that went uh, down to the front of uh, Abbey Road and I came out of the, of the control room to, to go across to do something or other and I heard this voice normal and, and, I, and I looked down and I could see John, John Lennon at the end and his leg was covered in plaster so I said, you didn't. He said, yeah, I did. <laughs> so I said, oh my God. But in actual fact, he was having me on because he, he did hurt his leg, but it wasn't done skiing. It was done uh, during a fairly hectic party, apparently. <laughs> and John was dancing on the table and he fell off. <laughs> And that's why the leg was in plaster. He enhanced the, the plaster, of course, and made it bigger, I, purely for my benefit, for the joke, you know, there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he had, we had so many laughs together. But uh, shall I tell him the story about the... the uh, 
Yes, the answer Ron? is yes. I don't even know what the story is, but the answer is yes, Norman. Well, uh, I, there was a, uh, I was often asked, um, I've forgotten the title of, of the song. I'm going uh, um, to. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I was also uh, often told by the press that uh, my favourite song uh, of the Beatles was one that John wrote, No Reply. So I said, well, no, it's not necessarily my favourite song. I'm very fond of it. But I did write a parody on No Reply. And I'll sing it to you. I tried to telephone. They said you were not home. That's a lie. Because I knew you were in, knocking back the gin. In your room. <laughs> and this, this really tickled John, John's fancy. And you know, he told me a bit later on that whenever they were out on tour or doing a concert or something and they were doing no reply, when he, got, when he, when he came up to sing it, he, he almost sang my lyrics instead of his own. <laughs> And that's perfectly true. <laughs> now, we've only got a few minutes left, and I want to cover a couple of other things, because uh, after your career working with the head of Parlophone, signing and producing Pink Floyd and many other artists, the musician in you, which, as you said, you'd been a jazz musician way back, you'd been a songwriter all the time, you'd written songs, Georgie Fame covered a song, you did quite a lot of songs that were covered by artists, and these were in the days, the 60s and 70s, where you had to be about 17 or 18 to be a pop singer, and after that you were considered old. Oh, of course, these days you have to be about 10 years old to be a pop singer. But in the 70s, you had to be very, very young. You had to be in your 18 or 19, or, that, or else it was no problem. You, in 1973, wrote and recorded a song that went to number one in England and then went to number one in America. Obey, what would you say? Tell us how you happened to write and record a song that went to number one in England and America. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, I, I, had, uh, I didn't expect to be um, a pop star, shall we say. It wasn't Obey that, that, that uh, actually eventually made me that. It was one that I'd written before for John Lennon. Uh, at, uh, uh, I, I had written, but I, I was, I was uh, did, I did a demo of, of, of that song, Don't Let It Die, it was called. And uh, I was sitting in my, I, I made a, a, a complete demo of it with me singing it. And um, I was sitting in my office uh, back at GHQ, Manchester Square, with, with the door open. And who should uh, walk by but a uh, very famous producer, Mickey Most. And uh, I thought, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd see what Mickey thinks of it. So uh, I called out to Mickey to come in. And he came in and sat down. He said, well, I, I said, I want to play you something. So I played him my demo with me singing it. He said, well, who is it singing? So I said, no, uh, I'm not going to tell you until you tell me what you think. <laughs> so... He sat down and listened to it, and I, I, was, I could tell by his face that he was quite impressed. And he, at the end of it, he said, well, who is it? So I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, because he, he had his own rack label, recording label. He said, well, I tell you, if anybody brought that song into me, that demo, I would take it on straight. I'd even pay money for it, because that's a top three record. So I said, I mean, I really fell off the floor, you know. So I said, really? So he said, well, who is it singing? I said, well, you're going to change your mind now because it's me. <laughs> he said, no, I'm not. He's, I said, I've written it for John, John Lennon. He said, forget John Lennon. Put it out as it is. That's going to be a top three. Well, it got to number two. So that's really how Hurricane started. But, of course, I, I had to find 
a name. I wanted to re retain Smith, but Norman didn't sound right for the... Uh, for the and um, I happened to see um, um, an old movie being, was come, being rerun on television called Hurricane Smith. So I thought, that's it, that's the name. So that's how I came by that name. And of course, Mickey was right. It, it uh, got a big hit. And, and so Hurricane was born, and uh, I had to have a follow-up. And that, once again, doodling at the, uh, sitting at the piano, doodling, oh, uh, oh Babe suddenly came about. But I had a hard job writing the lyric. So what I did, there were two uh, gentlemen that had just won Ivan Novello Awards for their lyric writing. So I sent them a, a copy of uh, my tune, etc. And I said to them, well, if, if you don't like the tune, write the lyric for me. If you don't like the tune, just throw it in the basket, you know. So they said, okay, well, uh, we'll let you know. So they phoned me a few days later. I said, yeah, we, we love the tune, etc. But if you don't like our lyric, throw it away. Well, about six weeks went by, and I hadn't had heard from them about the lyric. But eventually, it arrived. And they called it, um, I'll take tea if that's okay. So I thought, what? And it went, uh, da -da -dum 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 -dum. I can't remember their lyric when it came to it. So I'll take tea. If that's okay. <laughs> so that lyric finished up in the waste paper basket. <laughs> and it was only Eileen, my wife, when I was really struggling for a lyric, she said, well, why, why don't you write a lyric about when you were younger? I was a very shy boy. I used to go to a dance hall in Hornsey, called Hornsey Town Hall, and I, every Friday night I would go there and I would fall in love with a girl that... Uh, I, I saw her there from a distance, but I was too shy to go up to ask her to dance. So that's really when she uh, reminded me of that story, that's how I, I wrote the lyric. It was that story of when I was young, and I was too shy to go up and ask her to dance, etc. But I would, if she said yes, I, you know, I dreamed what I would do for her, send her flowers and stuff of that kind. So that's eventually I did write the lyric, put it out and of course big hit, thank God. Now you and Eileen have been married for how many years? 62. <laughs> 62 years. <laughs> Eileen, are you in the wings? Eileen, Eileen, come up and say, come in a little wave, we'd like to see Eileen. Your wife of 62 years inspired this song. Come on Eileen. So I'm going to help her up. 62 again. years married, Eileen! Eileen Smith! There she is. There she is. Hello! Eileen, I hope he's given you half of the record royalties. I get all of it. <laughs> She does too. I made sure that the cheques were made to me. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eileen. Thanks for coming up and joining us on Get stage. Me How's it going? Hey? This is my son, Nick. Hey, Nick. He, by the way, is a great sound engineer and producer himself. So, Norman, as our time on this stage now comes nigh, you've performed that, so the last time you performed that song in America was on the Johnny Carson show. Yes. Johnny, alas, is not with us, but I gather tonight, when Liverpool are playing, is it possible, just possible, I hear rumours that you might be getting up on stage and doing the song again? Do you want him to do it tonight? Okay, okay. 
I'll do it if they're paying me enough. <laughs> well, we'll pay you enough, but the money goes to Eileen. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, I'll do it tonight. That's wonderful. That's going to be tonight. You wrote this book um, and the title. Just tell us why you came up with this lovely title of the book, John Lennon Call Me Normal. Just give us the history of that title. Well, I mean, the, the history is uh, John, he loved wordplay. You know, he just did. He liked, one of his favorite words in the early days was spastic. <laughs> everything, everything he liked or didn't like would be spastic, you know. So, and these days that's not politically correct, but in those days people used it all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. And then, I don't know, one day he started calling me normal. And uh, <laughs> instead of, <laughs> of normal, I thought, well, that's close enough. <laughs> so, that, that really, it was all down. He had other words as well, which I. It's difficult for me to remember now, it's so long ago, but that was his main thing. He, he loved wordplay. Uh, great sense of humour, of course. Now, you've taken this wonderful time to write this book, um, John Lennon Call Me Normal. You're going to be signing it uh, here, and you'll be back again tomorrow, um, performing tonight, but sign back again tomorrow to chat. And this book is going to be officially published in August, but we're thrilled we've got a special advanced edition just for the Fest for Beatles fans. It's going to be a collector's item. You've got to buy it and you've got to get it signed. This gentleman, the architect of the early Beatles sound, Norman Hurricane Smith. <laughs>